Thinking Basketball Podcast. My name is Ben. Welcome back. And uh, it, it is today a, a show that I can't even speak. I'm so excited. I'm like a, a little kid on Christmas morning. Um, here, here's what's going on. L- let me download everybody so we're on the same page. Uh, I started making a w- Victor Wembanyama video a couple weeks ago. It's out on the YouTube channel. I did this because I have been following Wemby since last season in France. We did a couple videos last year, did a video for the NBA. We, we, we looked at him at the beginning of the season, and then the Spurs just became almost unwatchable. Like, what are they doing? What's happening? Who are they playing? They're not playing point guards. They're not, I, I, I've seen enough. I can't take it. And then like a month and a half ago, um, he just started playing like a madman. They moved, finally moved Trey Jones into the starting lineup. They moved Wemby to center. I started watching again, and uh, I needed someone to come in and talk to me and hold my hand and figure out what I was seeing because I just could not believe what I was seeing. I don't think words can put it into perspective. So uh, to go through this journey together, I could not think of a better person. The one, the only, J. Kyle Mann of The Ringer. You, Kyle, you just made a Victor Wembenyama video yourself are we going to be able to make it through this podcast without saying just some incredibly outlandish things to other people that sound completely normal and reasonable to us um yeah i think you and i have had this 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 situation before with some players uh in the past of whenever whenever a player um comes out of the gate and just does things that you've never seen before whenever they come out and they're just kind of resetting you know, benchmarks that you even thought were possible. Uh, I think it's natural to kind of, I always, I always said that I huddle up with the people that I trust the most to tell me that I'm crazy. I mean, that's generally, you know, when when you need that in your life, I think in general, like just in the broad sense, you you need people to be like, Hey man, you need exercise or people that give you like the, the come to Jesus at some point. But like with, with Wimby, yeah, and, and basketball in general, I, I find myself in this situation where I'm like, this feels crazy. I need to run this by somebody. And I think you and I, what's funny, I think we discovered that we were both making a Wimby video, I don't know, it was like 10, 12 days ago or something like that, right? I mean, you've been you've been just, I don't even know how you're doing it. You've been a madman putting out the Wimby videos lately. I could do a Wimby video like every two weeks, I think. <laughs> I, th- I think we've made five. Um, it is a combination of... The stuff we're going to talk about today, the curiosity and and just how good he is and what's happening. And then th- he keeps changing. He, he had to say, I, I, he's like a sponge. I mean, maybe we should start here because this is in a way the most tantalizing thing to me. I think the caveat with any of these players and anything that we're going to say today is health, right? Players have to play long careers. They have to hit their prime. They can't have injuries that sidetrack them. And so far, knock on wood, Wemby has had a trajectory that's been healthy in the last couple seasons. And you go back to where he was in France last year. And by the end of the season, Kyle, he's playing out there last year with names that were former NBA players, big basketball names of the international scene, playing really good talent, playing men, 25, 30 year old veterans, right? And He's having this massive impact footprint. He's carrying his team. He carries his team all the way to the French finals, even after they lose former Boston Celtics point guard Tremont Waters. Like, there's a lot of talent out there, okay? And then he comes in, and and I saw the same thing. I saw his first summer league game, two rows off the court. And it's like the speed, he talks about it right after the game. He's like, the speed of the game was a little faster than I was accustomed to. I'm going to have to adjust to that. And then, like, a couple months later, he just completely adjusts to that. Like, I, I, this is where my brain is starting to kind of go haywire with he's just turned 20 years old. Can he just keep adding things and keep learning? And we'll get to the passing because I think it's reflective of this. But uh, the ceiling is hard to kind of rein in right now. In the video, I called it analyst vertigo. And that's very much how I feel. <laughs> uh, I... Yeah, whenever we're both parallel, like working on a video, um, I I mean, I go out of my way to not watch your stuff just because I trust your opinion so much that I don't want to be influenced. And I do that with a lot of pe- like basketball people out there. I'm like, I have to finish before I gain a lot. I don't know if you're like this, but like I gain a lot of my like a lot of my basketball thinking is through com- direct conversation. I'm always hesitant to read people because I'm like, 
I don't want that. I, I'm just very careful. I, I think I had a conversation with a musician buddy of mine one time where I was like, you ever listen to this? And it was a band that was like a direct peer of theirs. And uh, he was like, I can't. Like it, he, he was just saying he had certain periods where he was like, I can't. I know they're great. I'm not going to be able to do it until because you know, he, he didn't want to be influenced by it. Um, and I, I think that's, that's, it's almost like a form of respect, like, a, like a, the highest form of respect, but, um, which, you know, I have for you, but like when we were working on that parallel, I was like, um, curious to see what you were going to come away with. And we hit a lot of similar beats, like very similar. But one of the ones that made me laugh was, in our conversation, you see, you said, well, when you said you had analyst vertigo, one of the things I cut from my video just for time was, uh, I'd said I was wandering in the fog. That's what I felt like. And that speaks back to what we were talking about before, which is just, and the reason for that is, and I don't know if you want to start here. I, I think I texted you this and you were like, don't stop. You just like cut me off. Like, don't say that. Um, is the, Put the cards on the table, man. I mean, like, I think, you you, you know, guys come into the league and, you know, I, I'm doing my rookie rankings and I'm, you know, mapping out what everybody is a top 200 player They're What I think they'll do from the age 25 to 28. Is it is it all star? Whatever. Wimby cards on the table. I mean, maybe we'll lead with this and, and cause some people to bristle. But like what what's the ceiling man i mean like i i i don't know what to take off the table like you you said health is the main factor here you just kept texting me just to stay healthy just stay healthy just stay healthy um do you think i might as well just say it i mean i might get struck by lightning i mean is it on the table for him to be the most impactful most successful nba player ever yes is that it yes 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 i'm glad you said it i can just say the yes part um i don't think we get aggregated which is nice I don't like. <laughs> Nobody I, cares. Nobody cares. It's I mean, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, no, in all seriousness, this is where my mind is going. We might as well start here, and then we can get into the particulars and talk it through at a at a more granular level. But like, this guy at a high level could be the best defender in the league. Very clearly, like historical level kind of defensive impact. And then all you need to be kind of a GOAT candidate traditionally is to be a really good all-starry kind of offensive player. But there are things happening with his offense, and I'm not saying they're, you know, very, very highly likely outcomes, but there are things happening with his offense where you go like, whoa, could you build an entire elite offense around his presence on the court? And we've never really had that. We've never had, like, the best defensive player in the league by a landslide and then an offensive player who's like in the conversation for one of the better offensive players of all time. And that combination to me, I mean, first of all, it easily puts you in the goat peak conversation, but the whole concept of like, where's the ceiling right now is he's only just turned 20 years old. Um, I mean, it's soft, it's squishy, Kyle, there's not a hard ceiling there when I watch him. No. And it's just, I think that's surprising to a degree in the sense that it goes back to what I was saying about him being a sponge. His his IQ, his feel for the game, he's clearly cerebral, and the way he can process this information and then grow. Um, if that keeps happening, like I think the most interesting part of what I got into in my video was the motor and the off ball stuff. That was a great like, point. Like, that's the motor cra was, yeah, the, it's crazy. I mean, the off ball stuff. I I noted too, and it was like, um, I, I like that we both got to that. But those plays are just, they're not subtle. I mean, I don't think it's a, but I, um, yeah, the motor was a really good point. I, I was glad you brought that up. The, well, um, go ahead. Well, I just had, to, I had to cut for time because when you show motor plays, they take eight, 10 seconds, the guy sprinting down the court and then changing direction. So I, I ended up cutting sort of, an entire like dedicated motor section of plays that I had. But if you watch the video, you'll notice he's moving a lot. And there are plays, Kyle, where like he'll just sprint down the court before everyone, get into the post, switch sides to go to the other side with the ball, spin and expect a lob. Like it just keeps going. And if you have that motor on offense and defense, these are the kinds of skills that you can't really quote unquote teach. And then you combine those with feel. And it's like, oh my God, how are you going to... If this guy ever learns to shoot well, how on earth would you stop him? I I, I, uh, I, I cut this out. We'll just talk about all the things we cut out. I, I was trying to keep it to a tight 10. I've been trying to move quicker these days, as people have noticed, and I appreciate it. But um, I, I cut this out because I was like... What it reminded me of was 
I don't know. If, have you ever booked an Airbnb? Have you ever gone on? This isn't sponsored by VRBO or Airbnb. I'm open to that. Thanks. But um, <laughs> I, have you ever gone? Have you ever gone on their app or on their interface at all? Well, they're not sponsoring this, so I've gone and booked at a third party reservation non hotel site. <laughs> yes, continue your story. Yes, any third party reservation site works. But you know, when you go through there, sometimes we've had this experience. I'll be like. I want a house. I want it to have this. I want it to have this. I want it to have this. And you watch the available options. It just keeps going down, right. down, down, down. And I keep thinking when you were describing, um, I made this point in my first video about Wimby too. It's just overlaps the filters of players. Like you just, you mentioned, we've talked in the past about O one D ones players that are defensive anchors, but also hubs on offense. That's just what what I mean. LeBron has had moments where he's had to do that and done it. He typically picks his spots a little bit. I guess the 2015 one was the one where we were like he had to do it and he did it because it was like do or die, brass tacks. I don't has he ever done it for a whole season? Really, I don't. I wouldn't say so. I'm not sure anyone's ever done it. I, I think you can. I think there's spots where players can be that, like Kevin Garnett on the Timberwolves. You know, you can you can be that. But the reality is, you want on an idealized high-level championship team, you want him to be the second-best defender. LeBron, do you want to over... You know, 2013 Heat. Could you argue that he's your top-tier defensive anchor? Yeah, I don't know, maybe, but you typically... It's like 0-1-D-2 or D-1-0-2, and to have a guy who you can look at at 20 years old... Um, Kareem, maybe, is the, is the great traditional example, because I think back in his day... Kareem You're talking like 72 Kareem? Exactly. Yeah, like early 70s Kareem. I, I think you could make the argument was a legitimate, like in that game, offensive anchor engine and also defensive anchor. But I mean, otherwise, we're just talking about like fairy tale stuff to the point where we're not even 15 minutes into this and there's already going to be some people in the comments who are like, you guys got to slow your roll. And it's like, you, ha in some sense, you have to trust that this is all Kyle and I do all the time for decades. And... We can try to go through the players who have elicited this. There's not many, but there's just some crazy stuff going on with Wembenyama right now that that really is warranted uh, warrants this kind of discussion without it actually sounding like it's going to sound like ridiculous hyperbole. But if it's not, that's the thing. He's like already really good. He just turned 20 years old. I well, you know, the the key thing to always put out there is, and I, I said this in the the initial kind of eval I did of him. I was just like, yes, this is the ceiling. These are the flashes. This is what could pan out. Is he going to stay healthy? Don't know. Is he going to continue to get better? Don't know. We yep. don't know those things. They have yep. to happen. All we're saying is that like the template and the and the outcomes are we haven't. They're not ruled out, and it usually gets ruled out pretty quickly for guys as we've talked about. Like the train leaves the station quickly. I the only the one thing I wanted to say with the the search filter thing is like when we talk about the overlaps of the O one D one the the passing the defense like all the different little intangibles that he has. The one that you mentioned first, I think, could be the separator, and that is. He's smart, man. I mean, you listen to him. I was telling you, I was like, this. I he's he seems like like an Ivy League type person. I'm not. I mean, like he seems very, very above average. I mean, you know how people speak is that's that's a tricky way. That's a, that's a tricky way to evaluate you know someone's intelligence. But I think if you look at the way that he he like clearly reflected on that first game that you talked about, which was a great example. It's one thing to say that a lot of players say things like that. They have, you know, reasons for like why they don't things get in the way of your self improvement. I'm sure every person listening could relate to that. But Victor seems incredibly focused. Um, he just seems like he has. He runs a little hot sometimes, but he seems like he has the right kind of temperament too. Like very competitive, but also uh, very thoughtful. Like I think that could be a huge, huge part of this is that he's just a really smart kid like uh hate to call him a kid but he's he's just a smart smart person yeah there was a play in uh a game with Mets 92 last year where and I have it in one of the videos I did where uh first time down the court they double him in the post and so the double comes from a certain place and he either he either makes like a basic pass or like struggled with the double I don't remember next time down he knew exactly what was coming and makes this like beautiful wraparound layup pass because he knows exactly how they're going to play the coverage after one time. And that's the kind of thing that jumps off the screen to me when I'm thinking of like, how does, it, how does an athlete process the game in real time? How do they learn from repetitions? And we've seen, especially in the pace and space era, like 
from LeBron James to Nikola Jokic to Luka Doncic, like the better you are at being able to dissect that at speed. Because that's the thing when we sit at home, sometimes we forget about like athletics. You don't have time to think about it when you're out there. It's just you can think about it in between the games. You can think about it in between the plays. But it's these guys that have this processing power to kind of slow the sport down as they play it. I think that's a big thing to look for. Um, The other thing you said that was so interesting is last season, um, as interesting as Wemby was to me, Last season, coming into the league without playing an NBA game yet, we were still at a place in my head where it's like, okay, yes, in theory, you have the foundation, you have the blueprint that could give you like a goat level peak that we've never seen before. But a lot of things have to happen. Mm -hmm. And now what we've done is usually, as you said, we go in the other direction. The guy plays in the league and you're like, "Ah, Evan Mobley, how are we going to get you to shoot? You know, like, right, Jaron Jackson, how are we going to get you under control? Usually it goes the other way, and that's that's not a knock on those specific players or any of these players. Luka Doncic, how do we get you to be a better defender? It's not a knock on any of those guys. It's the reality of having to check every box. And what's happening with Wemby is we're going in the other direction. I feel like it's planes, trains, and automobiles. Like, we're going the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> how, do, uh, how does he know where we're going? That's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, but, like, what's happened is Wemby's come out, and it feels like he's adding things. It feels like he's going, ah, actually, I can just be like a seven and a half foot tall Steph Curry and just run around in circles and you can throw lobs to me. How are you? Let's start there. How are you going to stop that? Then I'll work on my other stuff. I, yeah, have you ever? Yeah, him like adding the wrinkles. I think I think this like short kind of snapshot that we've seen of him, I, I always say like, you know, like sequential thinkers is kind of what you were alluding to with like LeBron obviously is like the master just chess player um Jokic obviously is at that level too on the playoff level in a series too um I don't, there's a there's a sort of a, a stuffy highfalutin quote you know Francois Truffaut you ever heard you, you ever read much about him well he had a quote that I really like where he was just talking about directors where he said that like a director tells you who they are in the first 150 feet of film basically and I was think I was thinking about that and I never used it at a piece or anything because I was like I figured I knew what the reaction would be people were like dear God you insufferable douche uh, but I love that quote wait, wait. I put in a I put in a horse racing clip in my last picture of a Yama video. <laughs> Francois Truffaut. Uh, no, I mean, I love that clip, though, because I th- I think that, like, early on, guys do tend to show you who they are if we pay attention. And I-, I think that, like, his ability, his adaptability, which I always say is, like, something with, like, prospects I try to look for is, and it's hard to see. You have to really lean in and look, read between the lines of, like, what were they – what were they improving at? How did they go about it? What? How did they adapt? How quickly? I think that's what we're seeing with him is like the learning part of it. You said in 25 games. I mean, we're, we're some of those things I, I want to go through with you and like run through like most likely to least likely like things of like to we're talking about the template of how he could get there. I want to run through those and like just kind of gauge our optimism or pessimism about those things. But if this is who he is, if this is how he's going to improve, I think that's going to impact how we feel about those categories. And um, yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the off-ball stuff's insane. Do you want? Do you want to just pick one? You want to start? Was that a good way to go about it? Or let's, uh, let's, how do you? Yes, this is fantastic. Let's do it. Okay. You want me to pick the first category? Well, it's your show. Yeah. I well, mean, you were on a what's, roll. What's, you were. What's you were going... the thing? What's the most? I mean, let's start with the obvious thing that we know we're going to be able to bank on, assuming that he stays. Well, all of this will assume obviously that he stays healthy. The thing that we know that is most likely to be elite level. I mean, I, it's going to be defensive anchor. I think that's the thing yes. that's just, and that's by a function of just his size, his IQ. I mean, what do you, what do you think? Well, I'm I'm wondering like where he gets better and what that looks like. And I think it touches on a couple areas. I think it touches on the first thing I actually wrote down, and maybe we should start here, is physical uh, frame growth, like strength, size. Does he fill out? Does he add muscle? What does he weigh at? Uh, what does he weigh when he plays in his prime from like 24 to 28? Is he much more muscular than he is? Does he stick with this sort of like slithery Kareem build? You know, you guys add strength. You don't have to add a lot of size to add strength. So you can add strength and that will come naturally. We both talked about the balance a couple times. He's this guy who's this just 
unbelievable. He's like an alien of a human being. I sometimes can't believe he's a real human being. I'm like, wait, you're like, you're eight feet. Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis, okay, has Anthony Davis is seven and a half feet. He's got these freakish arms, and you see him make these plays that you almost have to re- – you cannot believe he blocked the shot. You're like, wait a second, how did he get there? His offensive rebounding, his lob threats. Um, we can have a whole sidebar. A- Anthony Davis, obviously underrated by so many folks historically. I was just playing around with some of these all-time playoff scoring efficiency numbers that – add your own offensive rebounds when you clean up shots and stuff. And like Anthony Davis, one of the most efficient big volume playoff scoring stretches uh, going from 2015 in New Orleans all the way through his early Lakers years. So that he's seven and a half feet. Wemby is another half foot, Kyle. Kyle, he's, a, he's another six more inches. Yes. Uh, there's a few <laughs> things to unpack in what you said. I was curious. If, I mean, the balance thing, you know, I'm obviously, I'm a, like a, like armchair <laughs> like a uh, biomechanic. I'm interested in it. I love talking about it. So I t- t- grant you that frequently I'm talking out of my ass, but like watching him, it seemed pretty, that was something that didn't pop as much to me when I watched him with Mets 92. I knew he was coordinated. I was like, he's clearly, but, but the, the extent of his balance um, really has blown me away. Like, like in terms of like his ability to take contact. Now I think, I think the removal of Zach Collins out of there has just put him in space with more of these individual matchups, um, like I understood why they wanted to put Collins there to maybe protect him a little bit. But the fact that he's able to make these like outer like reach for these plays, that his timing is so good. He's his sense for how to avoid body to body. Like he meets guys head on when it, when it's needed. There was a game against um, I think it was against the Rockets. Like down the stretch, there was a play in transition where he just met Jabari Smith head on and blocked him and then there was a loose ball and he reaches over and you saw both both ends of how he can protect the rim so he does it some but I, I'm just I guess my point is just that like his ability to sort of hold up and still maintain his dexterity and coordination and like uh, ambidextrousness um, against these big physical players like Joel said that he didn't bother him did you watch that game oh yeah did you hear yeah, I watched that game. did you hear what Embiid said I grant you Joel Embiid had 70 points in that game. But, I mean, there were clear – did you hear what Joel said about Wimby after the game? Um, I only I only think I heard about that – the one quote that you just said about how he didn't bother him or something. was What was the detail? Did he go into more or elaborate on that? Well, I think um, I think Bon Temps asked him the question, and I was glad that he did. I was like, because I was I, I was like, I, that was what I would. If I'd been on the room, I, in the room, I wanted to be like, define bother, Joel, because right, he right. clearly made him think, you know. And I think like CPU just sort of usage in basketball, I think, is really critical. That like he clearly, you mentioned the extra amount of you know the extra inches, that six, seven inches, whatever it is um, that he has. You can just see him eating up the CPU of the players that are around him. Like he like just him being present. Like um there's almost like a magnet. I was trying to somebody explained to me like the way airbags work one time that there's like a ball bearing suspended in like uh have you ever seen this before? Like, uh, th- it's like there's a magnetism that suspends the ball bearing. Like, uh, that's more about like, forget forget that. that. That's more about his balance. But uh, he um, this this is what Wemby does to you. Well, you and I have talked about, and I have talked about how Bill Walton said that Kareem had like a Scotty Pippen body. The body part of it is interesting to me. I, I mean, I think he has that body type um, where he's still able to like leverage his length and stuff without being compromise physically like it like i've just been really impressed with all so that. i know I'm, i went yeah. wild there but yeah well let, let's let me let me try to rein that in and summarize it um the thing that jumps out to me is he's spinning and turning and jumping and and doing all these things and has this incredible control and awareness of where his own body is in space proprioception um but then you avoided saying it yes, i did too i didn't I, want it to but i, I, I did i know i had to get it out there there's a drink we got to play drinking games um on on thinking basketball that's how it works but the other thing is so many players like that with the higher center of gravity kevin garnett had this anthony davis himself had this you get a little bit of the bambi on, on ice because they get pushed around so easily at this point in time and that's where i think this connects to this first issue with me of like strength size growth um He'll never be a player, probably, 
that Giannis Antetokounmpo's you. He'll ne- he'll never play like that. He'll never try to truck you from a place of pure strength as his like superpower. It's more about how much does he add so when he's spinning off balance, he's actually never really off balance anymore. Um, I think it was an underrated part of Kareem's game as well. Kareem, in, in Kareem's case, if we stick with these like alien like, because Kareem, Kareem's listed at seven two, and it's always worth bringing this up as a reminder. Uh, Kareem was seven two barefoot, so he could have been listed at like seven four. So when you see seven footers like Akeem Olajuwon, he's like six ten probably barefoot, six ten and change. And when you look at photos, you'll notice like why is Kareem four inches taller than Hakeem? It's because he's seven two barefoot and he's legit four inches taller. Wemby's like another two inches. More importantly, his functional height um, is everything we've been talking about is actually eight feet. And so Kareem added a lot to his base. His legs got bigger. He got stronger that way through the core. Both of these guys, another thing about Wemby that is checked a box for me is like, man, the dude can like do splits. So he's like yeah. prioritizing mobility and pliability. He's as way part ahead. Of, he's way yeah. ahead on that kind of stuff. Um, I wish someone had told me that when I was 19, I wouldn't be so broken and, and injured. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's that's one of the, the, the things about him being ahead and having access to that kind of like um, just mind being mindful about his body and and uh, taking care of it, like that's the thing that's kind of dr- driven me nuts about people who are belly aching about the Chet not being an actual rookie thing. They were like, "Well, Chet had access to pro." I'm like, guys, Wimby has <laughs> been taking care of like the Hope Diamond since he was like, "Give me a break," and playing like professional. Like, I, I'm just sick. I don't want to get on that. I'm just sick of people saying you're, that. Like, you're, you're not excited about the fact that uh, a, a player playing his first year is not a rookie. Yeah, I'm. I'm not thrilled about it. It's. Uh, I'm just uh, the the discussion. I honestly don't really care who wins rookie of the year. They're both great players. It's not going to affect my appreciation. I know people wear it like a badge. You want to celebrate something. You want your guy to get the respect. I just feel like we're so past that. It's just a formality. Like Kyle. Uh, and any other any other year, we'd be going insane about Chet. Like Chet would be, and I am going insane about Chet. So it's like uh, it's not an either or thing here. It's just like it, Wimby's just so. The misfortune of being in a class with a guy who has a goat ceiling like that's just kind of what happens yeah the or whole Dwayne wade right yeah no, well, i was yeah or uh yeah carmelo I, I texted you this i i think every time i hear the you're only a rookie the year after you're drafted thing i'm like man they should have given arvita sabonis rookie of the year in 1985 <laughs> and then again in 1986 when he was drafted again um just Put that in your pipe and, and smoke it. Where where so were we? Bonus was mentioned. Drink. Uh, we were talking, <laughs> yes. Well, we're going down the list of likely to most. So so we're confident about. I mean, his switchability. How, how I mean, just in general, how are you feeling about that? I mean, it's, oh, I feel I feel great about it. But I, he doesn't I, have to mirror switch because he has that cushion. Like I was saying, like like he doesn't. He can hang back and be conservative and still still impact the play. The way he covers ground is incredible, and I think so. The other side of the defensive coin to me is like what I would call defensive feel or timing, um, he airs, if we think of, if we think of like a spectrum of just going after everything and going after nothing, maybe Jaron Jackson Jr. is on one end of the spectrum, right? Just going after everything when he comes into the league. Wemby is somewhere in the middle to me. He is very calculating about when he goes over and chases or attacks something. Um, and I think that's a feel that he's going to develop. When when do I need to be Hakeem Olajuwon around the basket on this play? And if you're not familiar with what I mean by that, Hakeem would just uncork all of a sudden three blocks. and He's like, nope, no one's getting a shot off while I'm near the rim right now. There are a lot of possessions you see Wemby. He's on the other side of the rim. So, there's some boxing out. There's some jostling. A play happened. And he won't go over yeah. and just reckless, recklessly chase that block. So I think the feel and the timing around the basket and then on switch stuff, I think that's stuff that can come. I think it's pretty likely that develops. Um, too. Yeah. You know, to be clear, if it doesn't develop, I think we're talking about a great defender, but as crazy as it is to say, because he's only 20, I don't think he would ever get into the GOAT defensive conversation. But I think it's pretty likely that this stuff develops where you get some combination of his strength and size and his t- his ability to dial in the timing and feel comes as he gets more experience. And the last thing I'll say here, Kyle, is it goes back to something he's done to every professional player that I've seen him play against. Uh, he's, he has such a great sense of, again, back to his body and space, of his own length. 
He has such a great sense for it. He blocks so many shots with his fingertips. He's got these incredibly long hands. And so when players on the perimeter size him up and go to shoot, they just don't even understand how their shot got blocked. I mean, Kevin Durant, the first time he played him, it was in the video we did at the beginning of the season. He blocked Durant's jumper, the Kevin Durant's yeah. jumper. And Durant thought he had Ooh. space. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Well, I was going to say Durant's hit that dribble pull up over AD. So, I mean, that's how, if you imagine the level of confidence that you have in your shot, I would, I would say that's one of the more iron, ironclad things to be confident about in basketball is Kevin Durant's ability to shoot over people. I mean, it just doesn't happen. And I think what you're saying about, like, um, I talk about this in the video about just him spooking people. It's hilarious. Like, I did not have enough time for all the clips of him, like, effect. And, and I think what, if you've never played basketball, you know, like when you play against somebody that long, the recalibration that happens is just hard to deal with. And I think over time, people are going to like start to maybe figure out ways to to poke at him and things like that. But even in like in that Bucks game, Giannis had a couple times where he was like, I know if I hit him here, it's going to create the teeny amount of space that I need to go with my right hand on the left side and sneak this by him. It was like a couple plays later, Vic was like, nope, not letting you have that. And he just like angled his body and then blocked Giannis and then blocked him at the rim. I just think those things are the types of things that the Gobert's, the ADs, they do. You just And, and it stops showing up in the stats at some point because – we maybe maybe we'll develop tracking stats for this play went at this player maybe they already have it i don't know if the hawkeye thing, i know the hawkeye thing was a disaster but like maybe they'll develop it where it's like okay the tracking pattern went towards this player and then went away because right now i don't think we totally represent that in defense do you think we do i don't know we we have it in what's missing we have it in the counterfactual so we can look at stuff Good like point. when Wemby's on the court versus Wemby being off the court and we should give it we should give a shout out to uh, Cody who just loves these numbers he loves these rim protection numbers if you look at that for certain players you can notice like oh wait a second the number of shots they take around the basket when Wembenyama's on the court goes way down the reason of course is because players will get to that spot and be like, actually, this eight-footer doesn't feel very good with Wemby <laughs> lurking right here in the drop coverage. Um, same thing with like the tracking data that you see uh, on our site uh, for subscribers at patreon.com slash thinkingbasketball. We'll have like uh, shots, and I think you cited this exact figure in your video, shots defended within six feet of the basket. We look at a multi-year sample uh, across the league. And what sometimes you notice with the Gobert's of the world, you already see it with Wembenyama, is the number of shots they defend is very low. The defensive percentage is off the charts. It's like 99th percentile. The players will shoot 11 or 12 percentage points worse than you expect. But it's only like four per 36. And the reason is because players are afraid to shoot around a player that's that effective. So it's hard stuff to capture, but I think if you look in the em the negative space, that's where yeah, you see it. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That's that was true with. Um, I, I guess I was thinking like literal paths. Like it would be funny to see if if someone could track the literal paths of, of I, the players. I think that's more what I was meaning. But Todd like, Whitehead you're, you're, could get on that. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, there'd yeah. be a lot of manual tracking if you're going <laughs> to get on that one. Uh, but I, the the only other one was. Uh, Second Spectrum had um, they they had the thing where you could see you know actions involving this player more specific tracking data like that and AD would always be a lot lower. You'd be like, oh, what's about that? You know, it's like uh, it's like no, it's not scheme. It's it's uh, it's preference. It's tr you know it's fear. Uh, but you know he spooked he spooked Giannis. Um, Giannis showed like shot a few like hurried floaters. But I was gonna make this point in the video and I I cut it again. Drink. Um, they Chet and and Wimby both have this in common is that like this goes both ways you know people are going to start poking at them like the Raptors testing the fences in Jurassic Park and trying to figure out where they where the weaknesses are it goes both ways Wimby and Chet are both you know I know Chet's another story but like they're going to figure stuff out too you know Wimby is learning personnel kind of preferences and things like that so it's that that I think he has work in form too what's the what's the next category would you say I think we have to talk about passing. Yep. You I think, think we're, have... that's your next most confident thing you would say? Uh, oh, the, we're, oh we're sorting, down? we're sorting most to least confident. Um, we did not prepare for this. So we're just in the moment. So I, I don't, I don't know if I put that number two, I'd say, well, I mean, 
I kind of I kind of think I would put. I mean, I don't know what other categories you have. But, I don't know either. When yeah, we, we you could have, you could start to have sort of a taxonomy like well, shoot, which shooting we didn't agree on right. Outside well, shooting sh- is big. Outside yeah. shooting is big. Um, finishing I, I, amazing. I think finishing is two. Finishing is two, right? Which and then shooting. Well, how much did how much does he even need to grow in the finishing area? Uh, no, no, I'm saying that's the next most. Like you want to talk about proprioception? That was the area that it blew my mind. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. He had, he had to play against the Suns early in the year. He caught the ball. It was a broken play. I think, or it was like a bad pass. He was on the right side of the basket. I tried to find this clip. I couldn't find it, but um, he had his back to the basket and just sort of like did the ron- you know the rondo right hand on the left side shot it's like his signature shot he does that thing where he comes around the rim and shoots this weird like he's he has his back to the basket and shoots this kind of backwards layup some people somebody out there know what i'm talking about Wimby did this thing where he was on the baseline had caught the ball was so, didn't you could tell he like hadn't looked at the basket in a second and without looking just turned around and his hand went directly to the rim and shot like a little drop in and i was like that was when i started thinking about the proprio stuff where i was like this is insane like and in traffic they'll throw those like end zone post post fade whatever the route is called where he catches it deep and without looking knows exactly where he is like i'd say the finishing i think is i'm higher on that than i even was coming into the season he's impressed me so much with that stuff yeah so i mean are 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 we saying that that has room to grow or are we saying that's already very likely solidified as something that we can kind of bank on as being because because it, it feels mostly baked to me it feels like he'll he'll clean it up a little bit right but lefty sweeping scoop shots well, um, we gotta talk about that we gotta talk about that but he's continue. thrown he's thrown some hooks off the glass me all right maybe here's a very specific subcategory of this category um just can he get a skyhook? Is that like a legitimate? Dude, dude, is it okay. a legitimate gotta thing? Talk, we gotta talk. We gotta talk about this. Okay, so yes, he could. He could. He's the one, and his hand size, I think, is why. That's the thing. You know, I'm, I'm not gonna get into the skyhook thing. People are probably sick of hearing about it. But like, I think he, his control. I think he has. He'll have his own version of it. And I didn't right, know. I, right. I hadn't heard anybody talk about this until I was lining up the clips next to each other, and I was like, Jesus, he's done this like 20 times. Like he has that play where he's usually on the right side in the short corner where I think he's going to be unstoppable like at some point like that's going to be nothing to do with him like you're not going to be able to do anything. he can do anything from there pass um shoot eventually but he does this thing where he'll throw like a stutter rip and go to the left across the lane he'll hold the ball out Ben and like you're not getting to it you're not going to touch him you might and like you're going to foul him if you try to I think that's going to become an iconic move. You know the one I'm talking about, right? His yes, arm looks yes. like a freaking highlight racket at the end of a like a pool cleaner, and he like holds it out there, and he has crazy touch on it, man. Yeah. No, I think the reality is the the beat for beat Kareem skyhook is probably too slow. Um, I mean, his quickness is another really interesting advantage that I kind of backed my way into at the end of the video. It's like, by the way, we haven't even talked about the fact that he just destroys people on the outside who are like six, seven to seven feet tall. It's really hard for them to stay in front of him sometimes. Uh, and he's a seven foot four dude, you know, rip, rip step, stutter step, rocker step, reject a screen crossover all in like the space of half a second to just completely get by. We haven't even talked about that, but I think <laughs> the, the, the mechanics of how he sets up a move like that around the basket are less important beat for beat to me than like, there's some long arm hooky sweepy extension shot that he could potentially master that in today's game if you got that thing it's it's kind of like Jokic's little short nerf floater shots inside 8 feet you get that thing up around 60% and just like it's basically over um it it just becomes incredibly difficult to slow you down in single coverage or in switches or things like that yeah, well, think I, I, about think about where his the center of his body is and where the ball is. Like you're <laughs> you're just not going to be able to like it's right. going to be a help defender that might time it well that might right. dig and, and get a hand on it, but yeah. or or bother his landing like you know charges eating up the landing space, building walls. But that segues perfectly into the passing, which I think again, if we had to put a confidence scale on this, like how much are we banking on it? I think there's a pretty good chance he becomes in the heart of his career a very good passer. I think there's a 
small but reasonable chance he's a great pa- like we talk about him as like did you see that Wemby pass um because again well, he just he just turned 20 and he's already throwing some ridiculously nice passes i think the expansion is everything we've talked about with tempo timing feel and then you start manipulating and dictating to the defense we haven't fully gotten there yet but that's because he's only 20 yeah, you're right that it does segue because it's like he's going to have a, a, a an awareness to sort of like the more people start to try to get, you know, clever, speak, going back to his ability to learn and his processing, hard to doubt that stuff. Hard to doubt that he's going to not pick that stuff up. And he, like, well, I'd ask you like, um, you know, Jokic is, I'm not trying to like wish him out of the league because I love him so dearly, but I'm just thinking about like the timelines of their careers. Is there going to be a point where Wimby's the best passing big in the league? I think that's very possible. I, I'd say... That's probably likely, Ben. I mean, I, I don't even think that that's Ooh. that's uncontroversial. I think. I mean, what what's another? Well, well, I, mean, I think you're forgetting? touching the high end. I think you're touching the high end. Yeah. What? I mean, who 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 else? I mean, uh, well, Shingun's pretty freaking good. I mean, I'm trying to think of another, um, another like the level of creativity um, of of the current bigs in the league. And we're talking ten, eight to ten years from now. You know. Yeah, so Sabonis will be basically gone because um, he's. I don't he's, think he's even as close as cre- as creative. Like I don't. I, like I. I always feel like Sabonis is much more of a a technician. Like he's he doesn't have the same level of flair and creativity. I feel like very good passer, but I kind of put Shingun in a different category. I, I'm like, just I'm just trying to list the the good big man passers for this sure. thought experiment. Um, part part of the issue as I sort of scan our board on the website here is that like. Big Luca, Scotty Barnes, these guys aren't traditional big men anymore. So you have a lot of big players who aren't really playing that post role. But yeah, I mean the the guys currently in the league, how many sort of traditional big men uh, could be better passers? It's certainly, if you fast forward eight years and you're eliminating all the players in their late twenties, I'm not sure there's anybody else in that like 25 or 26 under category that could match his ceiling now whether he can hit that ceiling is that's what we're trying to debate like how likely is it uh there's one play kyle it's one of those plays you sneak in a video and just let breathe for itself like you want to analyze it and you want to break it down but you're like i'm just going to throw this in there at the end with a little with a little casual voiceover i want to say it's against the pistons i can't remember who he's playing he's in that right short corner that you just wax poetic about and this is the whole thing of how this all fits together. They start to move a second defender toward him in help in the lane. Wemby faces up, because of course he's got a face-up jumper. Um, whether it's accurate now or not, we'll talk about in a second. But he faces up, looks like he's in position to shoot because he's got a wall of defenders in front of him. And basically in the same motion, lobs it to the front of the rim, to the teeny window, to Zach Collins for the dunk. He does that shooting. all the time. He does Th- that all the time. That's what I'm saying. Like, uh, well, he, the fact that he can already shot pass mm-hmm. at 19 and 20 years old, um, A, that reflects to me incredibly fast processing speed, B, that he's mapping the pieces on the court, and C, that means that I think we're headed to a place where he can anticipate and kind of dictate at that next stage of passing. So it fits with the first half of this podcast in the sense that the more defenses react to the scoring pressure he can put on them in different parts of the floor, the more that passing becomes something that just spikes your off. It's like, think about him off ball. Well, if you throw extra help at him off ball and the first passer can't punish you, but you somehow like hit Wemby in the short roll or hit Wemby when two guys go to him on the block because you have to double because you can't switch. Now the interior passing is already a great interior passer. Now that decision-making that's the thing that spikes your offense. So yeah. it all fits. It all fits together, and that I think he's, the passing is just. Whew. He's he's already demonstrated a really dynamic vocab for that. Like he, I think in like one of his first summer league plays, he went baseline and threw sort of a shovel pass in traffic to, I think it, it wasn't Sohan because he wasn't playing, but it was somebody on the Spur, on the Spurs summer league team. It might have been Champagne, but. Um, he did that, and I just went, "Oh boy, oh boy!" <laughs> I was like, because he 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 got criticism, and I I think this will be a segue to I think what people were sort of um, 
dinging him a little bit early, dinging him in in the early part of the season was, um, you know, you looked at Chet's very defined parameters in his role and how efficient he was, and then people would look at the sl- the the waste. You know, rookies with with the the car keys, you're going to get that with the you know Keontae's insane pick and roll you know usage and Scoot and all these guys. You you were getting that with Wimby, in addition to the just really weird. I don't even opti- miss optimization. I don't even know what the word is. It was the, the opposite. They were trying to experiment and get those guys reps. I understand that, but like um, the shooting part of it, I think is 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 the next part. Is that like I I feel like people really really zeroed in on the shooting with him early on, and they were like, you know, Jesus Christ, this is a seven foot four Kevin Durant, which he right, loves Kevin right. Durant. Yeah, both he and Chet do. Um, I think some of the I I guess this is where we should go from here. It's just like the confidence. Like I'm very, very, he's taken way, 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 way more dribble threes, unassisted threes than Chet. Is that going to continue to be a thing? Is that a necessity of like him being on a team with like no passers that can't get him easy ones like they should? I guess that's the question for me is like, where does, what types of shots is he taking? If this, if this peak does take place, does it clean up a lot? Does it, I don't know. Or does, does the shooting come around? Uh, No, I think, I think the shooting is a thing that could truly unlock it to like an all NBA or better offensive only player. We haven't even gotten to like, yes, okay, he might be the defensive player of the year, but on offense, how good can the offense be without him having that extra spatial threat out on the perimeter? How good can the offense be if you give him certain on-ball reps or in playoff series, you're inverting pick and rolls and playing with switch dynamics, but you don't have to worry about him hitting that pull-up three. I think it chips away a decent amount of value, but I also don't think he needs to be a 40% shooter, right? Um, mm-hmm. I, even, even as a rookie, you go, to the, you go to the film now, you see possessions where uh, he had at least one or two down the stretch in that Timberwolves game where they had the big comeback against Minnesota Gobert like sags off the screening action because naturally that's what you would do. And he's like, oh, I have space to shoot and I'm just going to hit this three. And he also, Kyle, this is a very, this is a non-analytical, this is like a very thing between you and me, a very old school thing. Kind of feels like he has that big moment clutch kind of like he he loves it, right? We saw it oh, in the yeah. we saw it in the Vegas showcase. Um, we've seen it at other moments in the regular season. We saw it in that Phoenix game at the beginning of the year where they're on TNT, and it's like all of a sudden I'm a slightly better shooter at the end of the game because I'm like super dialed in. He's a all, killer. He's yeah. a killer, man. So all that stuff makes me think he doesn't really have to. He's an 81 percent free throw shooter right now as a 20 year old rookie. Those are great indicators, but it's hard to like shoot 38 or 40% on a diet of pull-up threes, regardless of how big you are. It's hard to hit 38 to 40% volume threes as a spot-up guy if you're never in the corner. Um, Because if you're wondering why I'm going there, like most great players don't get to hang out in the corner. They're doing stuff above the break, middle of the floor with the ball. So I don't think he needs to get there. But I've kind of moved to a place, like if we're doing most likely to least likely, I think it's pretty likely, Kyle, that he's going to be a decent three-point shooter and that enough might unlock everything I'm talking about. 34 to 35% on some volume. He's already shooting way better on pull-ups than catch and shoot threes. You talked about off the dribble as a rookie. Small sample, but I don't know in his mechanics or the, the release on his shot. I don't know if it makes too much of a difference if he's the one dribbling versus the catch and shoot and moving into it, obviously the catch and shoot and moving into it pairs so well with his movement and his motor and the fact that he can back cut you and then take you back out to the perimeter and come off screen. He's like running centers off screens. And- uh, you you had a clip, <laughs> you had a clip in this video that I I just can't reckon. With. I can't I can't I don't know what to do with it. Like he the the fact that like and I guess the 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 level of respect for his jump shot will affect this but the fact that he anticipated the close as a 7 foot 4 guy and back can you imagine Porzingis doing that can you imagine that I can I can because Porzingis Porzingis is kind of sneaky quick for his Does size. Does he back cut closeouts like that though? I, 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 I've never seen that technique. Um I'm sure it's happened. 
Is that I'm the sh- one that you said you never seen that blew your mind? Yeah, the play? because yeah. because he did it on a couple plays. It wasn't just that one play. I had a couple other plays where uh, to, to for people who don't know what Kyle's talking about, he's picking and popping, and Wemby is popping out to the three point line, and then he's waiting for the switch defender to come. Pick, like the switch defender's watching the ball, and like, oh, I gotta kind of float back out to Wemby on the pop, and Wemby back cuts him right as he's doing that. And it's like, I don't know how you defend that. That feels impossible to defend without bringing extra, a third defender into the action. Yeah. He, he's, a, he's able to get, like, I, I think another thing about his, uh, his touch as a score that really just blows my mind, I think this might even have been in the Sixers game too, is, um, and I, I mentioned this in the video, is that he just gets this aberrational, like, extension and, st- and like, is able to just throw these little flip shots with touch that are just crazy. He had one where like he caught it in transition and turned around and basically did like a full extension, like baby hook and, and at the top of his arc, just flicked it with his fingers. Uh, and it, and it just softly went off the glass. Like those types of plays. I, he, he had one where he just like, he made Michael Porter jr. Look like he was like five foot six. Uh, the, do you remember? It was like in traffic. It was like, there were a couple different rebounds. He's tapped it to himself and you could see MPJ's just like, what what do I like? <laughs> like the, these players are being put in this situation. Uh, he did he had that like drop step dunk over uh, Luke Cornett that I think I'd sent to you. Where if you the can the reverse camera caught them coming up the floor and Luke Cornett had this look on his face like that's never happened to me before. Uh, so <laughs> uh, anyway, on the on the shooting and everything like that, I I guess it's um I need to go by and just kind of look at his dribble shooting numbers. The question is, like, early in the year, have, have those shots that were making him so inefficient, have they kind of, like, filtered out over the course of the year? Is his efficiency going to, like, change as we go because of the types of shots that he's getting? We mentioned this. His his In his offensive game, since they've gotten Collins out of there, his drives and drives of, drive efficiency has gone to the moon. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's it's crazy, man. I, I don't know. I, so, shooting shooting-wise, we're landing on – Pretty confident, not rock solid like the other ones, but we're confident. I think I'm pretty confident he gets to above that threshold as like a mid-level shooter. Um, he could be higher. Obviously, there's space that it doesn't come along. We've seen that. But I think there's enough indicators that I'm like, man, if I had to bet, I think it's a pretty decent bet that he's not a terrible shooter in five years, uh, especially with with what we've seen in shooting growth and shooting coaches and everything we've seen in basketball. I love that we're talking about like him improving as a finisher. Shot 76% at the rim last month. Um, I think it's 72% on the season. But of course, one of the things I was trying to figure out when making this video is like, every stat has gone through the roof. How do I, how do I describe to people that like every stat we track over the course of the season is going through the roof? The off-ball stuff, I think like three quarters of his offense is assisted. And normally you look at that and you go like, oh, he's very dependent on his teammates. And I'm like, yeah, he's dependent. He doesn't even have good passing teammates. No. If we could get him some good passing teammates, that number might go to 80% in the same way that like Shaq was secretly an off-ball weapon, right? Like if you if you tried to take away the post on Shaq, he spun back door. If you had the right passer or ch- like side to side swing in the triangle, Shaq would move from one side of the block to the other. And in doing that, he would seal all the space with his strength and size. Wemby, it's the length and the quickness. That's what's happening in the paint. And um, oh, there's, there's, there's just show. I, also, I should say, Kyle, I should say, Chet Holmgren, I think he's unbelievable. I think he's <laughs> absolutely, I think he is amazing. I think he is amazing. I don't like the fact that people pit these two players together. They're both great. I think I, I really hope if you've enjoyed our Wemby hour here that you can also give Chet his props because I watch Chet and I ogle and I Google and I got, you know, I feel like uh, uh, Walt Frazier sometimes when I'm, I'm like, there's Chet spinning and winning and di- whining and dining. There he goes. <laughs> um, but they're both great. But let's let's like finish by putting this in perspective. How many players in your basketball fandom, and maybe you have to go post-Jordan because this wasn't a thing before Jordan, how many players come along that you even go, yeah, I can see the, I can see the bare-bone skeleton of like a goat-level peak. It's not that many, right? I mean, that's what I was asking you before. In my lifetime, I mean, LeBron's the only one that LeBron, I can think LeBron's of. LeBron's the Lu- first one. Luka gave me moments where I was just like... Yep. 
what is going on here? Uh, 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 obviously, we we all are familiar. We don't have to get into that. Like the conversation about that, it's still amazing. All time Hall of Famer, you know, crazy. But like, I think LeBron's the only one, and I think I was, you know, I'm the same age as LeBron. So I mean, I think early on, I was just thinking, like, just trying to figure out with the shooting. Obviously, is the thing with him that's always. But like, honestly, I just, I feel like the physical stuff is probably more is more where you could draw a line and be like, this could be an, an issue. And I, I think that the the physical stuff is also plays in a lot to his shooting variables too. I, I think he's he's dealing with a lot more. Um, he's spinning a lot more plates. I think to, to become a better shooter. Like if you just think about all the physical traits that he's balancing to rein in and make sure. Um, I don't. I don't know if I have all the details to f- fully go down that ro- road, but. Um. Yeah, I, LeBron. LeBron, I would say, is the only other one. Like, um, is there another one in your lifetime that you think? I mean, Steph. Steph has had moments. I mean, yeah, well, the defensive side of the ball is obviously the thing. But like, as yeah. prospects, it's LeBron. It's probably Luca. Um, but I think we've landed in a very classic, like a very vintage Jay Kyle man thinking basketball place, where we could do like a whole nother hour on where you've taken me, because the difference between looking at these young prospects and trying to kind of like fit the outline of the of the roadmap to goatness, if you will, is actually very different than, oh my God, Steph Curry has created a new archetype for goatness. We just, we didn't, we didn't really fully appreciate what would happen if he just kept shooting and from farther away and did more and more and more. Jokic has this in a sense where I feel like I was very high on Jokic relative to the community in like 2018, 2019, as he was coming along. Uh, I remember doing a podcast with the great Adam Maras, who uh, hosts a really great show with Tim Legler these days. And we were taught, he asked me, I made a video about him and he asked me very specifically, he said, you have this line where Jokic, uh, you think he could do like, be more aggressive. Like he doesn't always dial it up. And I'm like, yeah, you could give him the ball. And he could just look to score, pressure the defense, and then force a pass every time. And he wasn't doing that back then. And you realize, like, wait a second, if you dialed that up, and this is where the out of nowhere thing comes in, and you made him Dirk Nowitzki as a shooter. <laughs> we like, he just showed up to the bubble. He's like, ah, I shoot 38% from three now and 55% from the mid range. How would you stop it? And that's what we've seen. So I think there's these two categories, Kyle, where one of them is, as it's happening, you emerge into new archetypes. You could argue Michael Jordan was like that, right? You could argue they were stuck in a big man's paradigm at that time. And then Michael, even with Magic and Larry, Michael Jordan comes along and he's just like this scoring rim pressure, psychotic maniac superhero in that category. But I don't know if you, I mean, Bob Knight did. Bob Knight looked at Michael Jordan and he's like, that's the best player I've ever seen. He could be a goat. But I think there's a difference if you're following what I'm saying between like, the prospect, Kareem, the prospect, you can see it on the map so clearly. The mm-hmm. idea of Wilt Chamberlain, but even better. <laughs> he, could he pass better? Can he score more efficiently? Could he be a better defender? Like That was the blueprint of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's goatness. With LeBron, the thing we always used to say is like, if he got a jumper, it's over because of his physical, his physical gifts, his size, his explosiveness, and how good he was as a passer. Luca, maybe not quite as much, but you could just see that, oh, like, if Luca gets a shot, could he be the best offensive player ever? Like, a real, real de- deadly outside shot. And then I think there are other players that come along and you, you line up the blueprint and it's harder to see it, even though they're great. Like Kobe, Dwayne Wade. You're like comparing that to Michael Jordan, right? You're like, okay, it's very similar, but are they like way better as shooters or passers? Can they get to the rim quite as much? So, there's almost two possible things we're talking about here. Wemby for me is very much in the prospect category, but what's happened in the last couple months, I think is like, uh, is he, is he going to be like a weird archetype that we actually didn't see? And is that his pathway to legit being considered one of the greatest ever? Yeah. I I think he is going to create a new archetype that I don't know if anyone's going to be able to follow him because it's so, a not, I, I mean, LeBron had this too, you know, I, I'm including, I'm including, you know, physicality with 
they're all aspects of your body. You know, they're all they're all tied together. Uh, hardware, software. The the software is incredible as we we've seen. I just think that the hardware, like I don't think that people are gonna like the fact that he's. I mentioned this in the video when I was comparing him to Chet. Is that like Chet is Chet lurks. I was I said Chet lurks and works. He like he you don't know he's there until it's too late. He's like he got you. He smothered you. But he's Wimby is much more of a like and a fit he's just a mountain in there. They, like in the same way that Gobert is, but he's also and I, I guess um what I mean too is that like, you know, the off ball stuff is I don't think that we should underestimate that. Uh, I don't know that we're necessarily gonna see him running off of like you know, Iverson screens like on the baseline where he's coming around. Like, I don't know that he's going to need to be used by that like that, but it could become a big part of his game. Um, and it, it's just, it's interesting, man. I, I, I don't know. Uh, the rim pressure was another thing that like I was curious about with him early in the season. I was just like, man, this guy can't even roll to the rim without getting like pushed around. Like, how is he going to be able to leverage that length? The space has really alleviated a lot of that. Like he's able to get to the rim. He picks his spots pretty well. Um, yeah, in terms of archetype, man, it, it's it's new because he's new. So I, I don't I don't know I don't know necessarily that this is a replicable archetype in the same way that like um I don't know. But what archetype like of this type is totally you either you either hit that mark or you you fit you either impersonate it or you fail. <laughs> I feel like you, most people that try to do this are going to fail just because they're not going to have his tools. Is what I'm trying to say. I feel like so many of the great players, um, kind of in a sense move into a space where they become hard to replicate. They become almost sui generis, right? Like, like they, I, sorry, I should never use Latin on a <laughs> basketball show. Um, they become, they become like a new breed, right? They become um, like, what, how would you describe Larry Bird before? Like, what's the archetype? It's exactly. like, you're, 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 you're anchoring him point. to Rick Barry, right? You're anchoring him to Rick Barry. But the reality is, even 30 years later, when we look back, if you go check out Larry Bird's Greatest Peaks video that we did, like, my wife watched it. She goes, why doesn't anyone play like that? <laughs> I'm like, I, it's just Larry Bird. Like, there's no way to describe it. Even Magic. Like, well, I'm just a 6'8 dude that plays point guard, but also I'll, like, take you in the post when I need to. But also this new pick and roll thing is cool. But also I kind of should get an outside shot. But also transition. That's where it's really fun. It, there's always this space that they go into that is unforeseen. And I think that's what's so interesting with, with Wemby and maybe Jokic in real time and maybe some other player that uh, we don't see coming down the pike. And um, I'm not even including I, – I see, Kyle, my hot take. I got, are we over the hour mark? This is when I can start letting him fly. My hot take is uh, Chet Holmgren is going right to the Hall of Fame. That's my hot take. Uh, I, I don't think, think that, that's wild at all. I, I, I just I think mean, that guy's to, amazing. I'm not trying to take the piss out of your hot take, but, yeah, <laughs> but he's, I think he's, he's just amazing. But it's it's to your point, there is a difference between like, do you do you have a pathway that I can squint a little bit and see and be the the greatest player ever? That there are degrees to that difference. Um, actually, you mentioned something earlier, and it's I think of it as like a squint test. When you go back and you watch the all time greats from doesn't matter who, Shaq, Tim, Duncan, uh, Michael Jordan, Burt, whatever. You the go, first 150 feet thing, is that what you're saying? Like, you, or, you, go you go, yes, you go back and you watch them as rookies. And there's fat to trim and maybe they haven't, like maybe LeBron doesn't have the post game and all that stuff. But like you watch the clips and the highlights and you see the shell. You squint mm -hmm. a little bit and you're like, that's the dude. that He's, com he's coming, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's what's so encouraging about what we're seeing and both these rookies, but specifically Wemby, you like, you can see, oh, if they're just a little better at this, oh, if he just has teammates that can pass, like the the Spurs cannot pass. They they just they're, miss him constantly. They're they're like, I don't even know if we can like articulate how bad they are at passing. Like I and I I tried to make this point too that like they're I understand why they were doing it. It's just. Um, I think Wimby's level of competence and like the timeline for him, maybe maybe I wouldn't be surprised if they had an internal huddle and they were just like, we can't mess around with this. Like I'm mean, like, I understand Vassell scoring tilt, Keldon scoring tilt. They wanted to get those guys. They maybe over leveraged them in a way that once they and got them some good experience. That once they did get some better fitting pieces, they could settle them back into roles that better fit them. And then they'd accrued this experience, so they have these tools that they can use once the team is better optimized, if that makes any sense. And Sohan, same thing. But 
I and that I don't I don't know I'd imagine a lot of these you had some thoughts about their roster about who's even going to be in the league which I thought was funny but um, I just think when you stacked all those things together it, it just made for a really tough situation and even like a basic like basically like backup level point guard like Trey Jones made a huge difference so it's crazy to think about where this is going to go on the on the Chet thing quickly I, I know we don't have time to get into it fully but I like the self creation thing I alluded to it a little bit I mean. Where do you think that's going to go with Chet? Are you are you feeling? He I'm, seems like a pretty competent dribble pull up shooter to yes, me. He doesn't yes. shoot with a ton of movement, but you see the handle, the way he gets down, in a very similar thing, like where he can handle pressure better than people even think. Because um, most people were like, "This is not going to work," like in the league when you watched his physicality, but he keeps proving it over and over again. I don't know. The self creation part of it to me is just like we even even they don't have to with Oklahoma City. Where's it going to go? I'm curious. I, I think we haven't even scratched the surface. Uh, I I think that you you I think you talked about his mid range pull up and how he already has that. You combine that with the fact that he can drive and f- he's got this really really soft touch with mm-hmm. both hands on his drives. That's the kind of stuff. And I know you've made the Pau, Pau Gasol connection before. Like you add a little spin hook touch th- that whole package you get the footwork he starts he's going to get a little bit stronger and sturdier you got a, a a pivot a jump stop a, a turn back for a hook um he's so good at attacking closeouts he's he's good enough to kind of I, I wonder if he could expand the triple threat face up from the outside if that shot is really dialed in because for chet uh just like the range of how great he's going to be if he ends up being only a good shooter, I think he'll be great. If he ends up being yeah. a rid- cuz he's 21. If he ends up being a ridiculously good like all-time level outside shooter, we're going to have to come back and do a Chet Holmgren podcast. He's um, he's, t- he's pow and AD. That's what I like. Like he's he's like uh, he's not as long as AD, but he's close. He's got some long arms. I think it's like 7-6. <laughs> I uh, Have you noticed he plays off his left hip like Durant? Have you noticed that when he faces up he like he clearly is a Durant acolyte, like which Durant, which is it begets begets. I mean, like it's Durant learned that because that's how Kobe played. But like he's he's got some of that stuff. I just think it's interesting. Let's uh, get out of here on this fun one. <laughs> you had one line at the end of your video about the youngest MVP ever, uh, Derek Rose. We, we forgot about this. Yeah, yeah. Derek Rose was twenty twenty two and like. Uh, four or five months. You know, Basketball Reference does the February first dating uh, in every year, so he was like twenty-two and a half ish. Wemby just turned twenty, so if he were to win MVP in two years, not next year, but two years, he would be the youngest MVP ever on our confidence scale. Let's just drop that as a bonus. How you you you? When you said that, I was like, what did he just say? Um, that's what I was going for. How likely do you think that? I mean, assuming in two years he's, the Spurs have a team, we have no idea what it's going to look like. Because I, the reason I don't think many of these players will be around is just history. When you go look at these rosters that struggle like this, that are this poor, that have these young players, and of course we can watch them and break down the film. Like You can see the issues that they have. I don't think most of these guys will be pieces on this team going forward. So given where they are today, how realistic do you think it is that He's in a legit MVP conversation in 2026. You're the expert on this. This is why this is hard when you. It's like going well, on a MV, show about MVP's narr- it's a narrative. and Stephen Hawking's like, "What do you think?" I'm like, I, 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 "Well, I mean, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. That's what I was gonna say. Like everything that we've described about, like you, you put yourself in a position where you're just like, are you gonna rule that out? And and when you're when you're talking about an array of things uh, that is really kind of unprecedented, are you really gonna like with a bold face say that that's for sure not gonna happen? I mean, like LeBron by LeBron between a between years one to two and two to three made. Such an unbelievable leap. And I think that we're talking about that level of intelligence and that level of range of impact. I don't think it's ridiculous for him to be in the MVP, MVP com- conversation. It could it could come down to just who's there, basically. Who else is there? Because, I, you know, I think Jokic is how old? 30? How old is Jokic? Uh, 29, maybe? Something He's- like that. How many yeah. more MVP conversations? He, he'll, he'll, he'll be 29. He'll be 29 in a couple of days. Yeah. I would say that it's very possible. I would 
you want me, you want me to go hot take and just say that I think it's going to happen? That like, I'm not saying he's going to like I can't say he's going to win because there's so many factors, but I think he could become that level of player. Yeah, I do. In two years, I, I I'm I really really hesitate to underestimate this guy. I love um, this. Uh, what do you, what do you say? I love what's happening right now. Um, I think I'm most intrigued by the physical growth in the off season this year. We've seen that so many times. We saw it with LeBron. Like LeBron was a great rookie. Um, he was not this good as a rookie. I said it at the end of my video. I don't think there's a rookie I've seen have a month this impactful. Like you, you could not easily name twenty players better in the month of January than Victor Wembanyama. That's n we haven't seen that stuff since the twentieth century, when like four year Tim Duncan's and Shaqs were yeah. in the league and things like that. So part of the part of the thing I've learned. You know, you said this is this is my bailiwick, like the aging curve of these great players. I look at how good you are at 19. I look at how good you are at 21. That's a huge indicator. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about all this potential stuff with Vic, but right now, Victor Wembanyama is like an all-star level player. We can quibble and, um, you know, he didn't have an all-star level first half of the season, but this is this upward trajectory that we're seeing. I don't think it's out of the realm. I, I would not rule it out, Kyle. I think the hard part is going to be what the heck kind of team is around him in the next year or two. And is he going to do this ridiculous thing where he puts them on the treadmill of mediocrity? Maybe like we've seen with the Mavs where it's like, I'm good enough to carry you, but yeah. that actually makes it really hard to get rookies and acquisitions and trades and free agent stuff. So the roster, um, to me, of course, Kevin Garnett just went through this with this forever in Minnesota, where literally if you go through and break down the roster, the analyze the roster, the age, the injury, the talent, the statistical output, um, the impact numbers. What looks like it's happening is Garnett, who came into the league as a high school player, kept getting better and better and better. And the roster kept getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And it just looks like the team is just like flat on the treadmill of mediocrity forever. So I think those are the confounders. But uh, it's just a function of the system. Yeah. I mean, like yeah. this system, man, uh, LeBron, Le LeBron had a lot of that too. Luke is going through that too. It's just, it's the, uh, it's the, it's the predicament of the floor raiser, you know? So yeah, I, I, all those things are going to impact his efficiencies, you know, because a lot of those, you know, the tracking efficiencies all are, are based on what happens after it leaves your hands and what, it, you know, and before it gets to your hands too. So those things are going to have play and play a role. So, um, yeah, I feel like we're both. Are we crazy? I don't know. People yes. are gonna get mad. And is the NBA discussion Reddit gonna be like these jackasses that hate? Well, they're Kate definitely Cunningham, they're gonna get mad. Which I don't yeah. for the record, but yeah. Anyway. Who do we hate? Who do we hate? There are a lot of Pistons fans that got mad at me and said I hated Cade Cunningham. I got. Uh, I know we're ending, um, which is ridiculous because I'm like is literally his biggest believer. Uh, we're. <laughs> I had a brief conversation the other day. I won't. We, we don't got to go into detail, but uh, I asked an NBA shooting coach about floater threes, and he opened with oh, no. guffaw. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, "I'll tell you what, Kyle. He goes, if you if you said if the, if that got around to the NBA that you were going to start shooting those shots, every uh, NBA team in the league would go be our guest." And uh, I was like, "Interesting." Uh, <laughs> oh man, that reaction was great. I can't do this to people. I will say that Norm Powell took a floater three the other night against the Pelicans, and I immediately sent that to to Kyle. Yes, um, you did. As does everyone. Whenever someone takes one, but, you, know, <laughs> you did this to yourself. If, if you if you want to support us, patreoncom slash thinking basketball. Uh, that's where we've got all these fun stats on Victor Wembanyama. There you can go see Victor Wembanyama, man. He's 20 years old. He's in like the top 10 in the league already in defensive EPM, which is uh, one of the better one number single defensive stats we have. And Chet Holmgren is not too far behind either. And, and he's only 21. He is a 21 year old rookie. I know it can be confusing sometimes. Your first year is your rookie year when you play. Heck, in baseball, this is going to really ruffle some feathers. In baseball, you can play. I don't know if they've changed this, but for years, you could play. And you wouldn't be a rookie until you uh, crossed over a certain threshold of games played. So you, yeah. there are baseball players that have won rookie of the year, like in their third or fourth year. Um, I'm sure that Chipper would make Jones it. do that. Didn't I'm trying to think. Uh, I think I a lot of did Alex, Rod Alex Rodriguez. I, he was so young when he came up. 
I can't remember. This is what people want from us. This is this. Yeah. The baseball I mean, people whenever, are loving this. Yeah. Whenever people, yeah, whenever people start like drawing the lines of like what's fair for a player, I'm just like, guys, in today's basketball environment, these guys, well, we can't have any kind of pro training. It's just like, buddy, I got news for you, my man. Like in the summers, these guys, this, it's a, it's a global game. I'm just saying, I don't know. I just. uh Get annoyed with all that, but this was uh, this was fun. Thanks for having me, Ben. Kyle, thanks so much for coming by. Um, thanks to everybody for listening all the way through. And as always, hope you are having a great day.